Welcome to the Jeff Knows Inc. Entrepreneurial Podcast with your host, Jeff Lopes. Jeff has over two decades experience as a serial entrepreneur, building brands like KimuraWare from his home basement to a multi-million dollar global brand that has sold over a quarter million pairs of boxing gloves. Jeff's here to educate, guide, and drive you on the process of bringing your ideas and dreams to reality with the inspiring stories from some of the top business minds. Welcome to episode 153 of the Jeff Nozine Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Lopes. Super excited to have on today, Lawrence Lotz, the Wolf of Queen Street. Sit back, everyone, and enjoy. We are live. We are live on the Jeff Nozine Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Lopes. Super excited to have on today, Lawrence Lotz. What is up, brother? Nothing much, man. Thanks uh, for having me on my show. Um, it's, I'm over in New Zealand at the moment. Uh, my accent might sound weird to some of your audiences out there. And I'm a sort of a guy that I love my hats. And I'm so happy to see Jeff uh, rocking one at the moment as well. I'm normally a straight peak sort of guy. Uh, but <laughs> we are in New Zealand. Um, we are enjoying our luxury of being in lockdown again. Uh, major lockdown across the country. The, Jeff, here we go. To your audience, we went into nationwide lockdown, full lockdown. You can't leave your house other than for groceries or mental health exercise for one case. For one case in the country, we went into full lockdown. Just just, just think about that for a second. So uh, it's what are we going on? Four weeks, we're still in lockdown. Um, so I had to wear my hat today because uh, my hair is getting a little bit of out of control. And I, I don't want to come on the show with sort of the African heritage of myself, the hair going out on the side. I love it. I, I'm a, there's, two, there's three things I collect. Hats, watches, and sneakers. Yes, I, I tick box on the first two. Um, I stay away from the third one. I don't know enough about sneakers, and I know as well that if I get as a sneakerhead, it's a very, it's, it's very much always been a sort of a legacy American thing to be a sneakerhead. Obviously, Jordan brought out the Jordan ones in the '90s, and every childhood that grew up through that, that that was that moment, right? And now it's become so fashionable to become a sneakerhead. So to me, I'm like, no, stay away, <laughs> stay away. Don't. Um, uh, my kids were massive. Sp- somebody sorry. told me years this, the hat is just a personal preference. Somebody told yeah. me had this incredible business um, gentleman. I, I became really, really close friends with, and he's actually passed away in the last few years. And he always said to me, this guy was all tatted, hmm. always wore a hat, always had a pair of jeans on, but would walk into a conference room or a business, yep. business venture. And just like everybody could be on suits and he would just walk in and he'd be the coolest guy in the room. Everybody wanted to yep. be around him. And he always said to me, he goes, if you walk into a room, there's three things you need. He goes, you need a nice watch, a nice clean pair of sneakers and confidence. And everybody yep. in there will want to be around you. It doesn't matter if everybody's in suits, it doesn't matter who they are. They'll all be surrounded around you. And, and I always took that to heart when he said that to me years and years back. And it's like, always nice shoes, always a nice watch. And just walk in like you own the room, and and it's just it's it's just that that attraction that that magnetism almost mm-hmm. that just attracts people to you, right? So I love that. So let's okay. There's so many layers to you. <laughs> Few podcasts, business, uh, some health issues we went through in the past. I want to start off just quickly going where where'd you grow up? Give me a little rundown about your your childhood, and then let's mm-hmm. get into. I guess the last four or five years of your life. So let's start off where where'd you grow up and, and let the honest know a little bit about your background. Um, so I'm South African born, um, um, born in Cape Town, South Africa um, in, in the eighties. And I was raised there up until my early twenties before I moved over to New Zealand. So I grew up through the release of Nelson Mandela um, through the first elections um, in 1994. I remember um, growing up in that experience. So very, I had very few years that I can remember of actually um, being in apartheid itself. Um, obviously, my parents uh, and my older sisters would have experienced all of apartheid. Um, but I remember in 1994, one of the craziest experiences to me, and I can still vividly remember it, was the country had no realization or or a lot of people in the country had no idea what was going to happen next. Um, so my parents went and sort of did that whole um, stock up and hoard. So we had six months of supply of food in our cupboards and our pantries and water and tins like you wouldn't believe in every hole and nook and cranny in the cupboards um, uh, in 1994 because we didn't know what would happen when Nelson Mandela came out and he was elected as president if the country would fall apart. 
fundamentally it actually went oh complete the other way of him yeah, bringing it yeah. together with the rest of the world right and it was an amazing such, uh, a, amazing such a powerful experience huh i i, 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 tr- I truly was to you know to have a set of experience that i almost sometimes most people don't wish to be older um, but I almost wish that I was a couple of years older through the 90s, just that I could have felt and experienced more of that change in the world uh, and South Africa itself. And then obviously, um, as I said, moved to New Zealand uh, in 2007. So it's like almost 14 years. What, what, uh, moved- what made you move to New Zealand? Work, career, school? Uh- Sorry, um, um, up until in my teens and early 20s, I was really big in rugby um, sports. So it's sort of, uh, to any American, it's gridiron with no yeah. pads. Yeah, um, so, <laughs> so we're, we're from we're, Toronto. We're from Toronto. I'm from Toronto, Canada. We have, it's crazy. Is uh, What are they called? We have a, a professional rugby team here that plays on an international level. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's, um, yeah. So they played this week against the USA Eagles for qualify for the World Cup. It's this week or next week. Which is crazy for a little Toronto team that has, yeah, yeah. So So there's, and and it's still, they they get no press here, like zero press here. It's such a hard challenge. Like the U, I know the USA Eagle. Um, I think they're called the Eagles, and I'm mistaken if they're not called the Eagles. The USA Eagles team, um, a good few years ago, they had a pretty decent team. So what they did, um, they were really clever when, if, especially when I was going up through my teens. Like I said, I played top level. So I played rep, uh, rep and almost national level, you know, 18, uh, 20, 21. And what they, uh, the American colleges would do, they would come over to the three big, the three big nations that would be South Africa, Australia, and New Zealand. Yeah. And they would find guys that were just below um, being signed on a contract and so forth. And they would say, okay, come over for a full scholarship um, over in the States. Um, we'll give you full scholarship. And what I did is was for the three or four years while this was going on, by the time I was sort of in my early 20s, the American team all of a sudden became like 60% American and about 40% Australian, New Zealand, um, very few New Zealanders um, and mostly South Africans that came over and it took their, their game to that next level because they knew they needed some um, foreign imports to yeah. get the uh, to get the nationalization and then actually improve the team and now the teams actually competes usa competes i think top 30 in the world uh or top 20 in the world even at the moment they go to most world cups you know you know i'm from K- toronto canada yeah i know uh, canada, oh, okay, is okay. A diff- diff- <laughs> canada is a different story brother <laughs> no, but, yeah, so have, I know. but we have the toronto we have a team from toronto canada yeah yeah please the, yeah, is- yeah. And yeah, so there, there's a whole lot of teams. There's uh, there's a big uh, professional league across um, yeah. all of America and stuff like that. I don't know uh, the final details of exactly how they work, but um, it's, it's exciting. No, but our, times. Our, I, I'll give you the de- I'll find out the details for you. But our mm. team from Toronto, um, they play on a premier level. level. Yep. Yeah, which is crazy. Like they're they're playing in New Zealand all the time. They're they're never they're barely ever playing here. They travel. They play everywhere else. But um, so obviously you had a. Uh, an inkling or a, a desire to turn pro that didn't yes. transpire. Yeah. So um, I went as 18, I played in one of the top um, schools in South Africa and one of the top schools across the world for, for, for up yet. Uh, at that stage, I went into varsity university for my first year, played um, 18 or under 19 varsity and so forth. Also loving the entertainment life and so forth. I find myself um, in South Africa, you can drink from the age of 18. So I started finding myself running and managing nightclubs and bars already from 18 to 19. So I got into a situation, I was really serious in my sport, um, but I was also working 16 hours with my varsity every single day. So I literally would work, I'll go to varsity, I'd go to work, work till 4 a.m., get about three hours sleep, and then do that whole cycle while trying to be serious in my sport. Yeah. So after about a year of this, um, I turned around to my parents. At that stage, it wasn't very common, and I said to them, hold on, something's going to break. I can't keep going like this. Um, I want to take a year off. I want to take a year off from varsity um, and find, you know, just find myself. Um, but it was quite, my parents didn't take it as well. It, it's sort of the OE or the gap year or that sort of stuff wasn't as commonly accepted, um, oh, geez, 20 years ago um, or 50, you know, 15, 20 years ago. But they acknowledged it. And my dad turned around to me and said, look here, I know if you take a year off and you stay in South Africa, you're just going to become lazy, sleep on the couch and play your sport, but not actually progress yourself further. Why don't, because your sports, well, why don't we look throughout the world and we send you overseas for a year 
um, into either Australia, um, New Zealand, or the UK, which is the um, the big rugby nations in the world, and see if you can f- uh, further your sport in that way. So as a 19-year-old, first time ever really leaving home other than a few holidays, I, I flew over to New Zealand alone and came and played um, in the top level um, club senior as a 19-year-old for, uh, for a year. And that's what sort of introduced me into New Zealand, the culture, and everything else. And the rest is history. The rest is history. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. Let's let's get into Lawrence as an entrepreneur. When, when did that venture start? I think it started very young. Um, I, I grew up in the house of my, my parents. Um, always pushed me to to drive to success. Um, I spoke just recently on another podcast of sort of one of the biggest statements uh, my my dad always told me growing up was, um, you know, you get the brand, the Ever Ready battery. Um, and he said to me, you've always got to be like an ever ready battery. He said to me as a kid and, uh, and I could, I said to him, what are you talking about being like a battery? And what he said to me is you've got to always be ready at that moment in case someone gives you opportunity for what you're trying to achieve. So if you want to achieve the success in, in the sport, or if you want to achieve the success in the business, whatever you're doing, you've got to be at 120% ready at any one stage. So that meant um, growing up, I was always pushing the limit to find how far could I push the limit. So I always had um, a whole lot of different ideas. Growing up, um, at fourteen, I started the local tuck shop or um, you know um, lolly shop at at my boarding school. At fourteen, I started running it out of um, my boarding school room. I had other people working for me, and I was making money, and I was making more money in like a week that you know than you know twenty one year olds out of varsity were making. And I was a 14-year-old kid at school. And that sort of started that whole ball rolling of always looking for where there's an opportunity to, to take the next step in business and so forth. I love it. I love it. I love it. So uh, take us into – how old are you right now, Lawrence? So uh, let me think. Uh, 37. 37. You're still a young puppy. <laughs> so when did you start with this whole coaching and, and, and the whole branding of the, the Wolf of uh, Queen Street and all that stuff? Like, when did it all start? So the, the, the Wolf of Queen Street podcast and the brand itself stood up in 2019. So obviously, uh, so not actually uh, 2018 into 2019. Yeah. Um, so it wasn't um, that sort of long, uh, that long ago itself. But myself into a brand um, and everything else behind it, I spent years and years before that of going out and speaking to people and helping as much as I can. And finally came to a situation in that time period um, where people said sort of in 2018, people were like, hey, you should look at starting a podcast and a brand and maybe do some coaching or some mentoring in certain sort of the areas. Because I'm guessing same with yourself, Jeff, we can handle, I can handle conversations no matter who I'm around or how big or how small you are in a corporate situation, I could always handle that really well. And three or four years ago, before COVID and um, podcasts became really trending, it wasn't as saturated. So you could go in there and um, build up a brand behind it. You know, most people four years ago only really knew about Joe Rogan and maybe two or three other podcasts in the world. So before I actually started my brand, I went and spent six months and started episode number one of Joe Rogan. And I got about halfway through his entire catalog, listening to him every single day for six months, just to understand what he stood for, the brand, the guests, and everything else to give me as much knowledge as I could before taking that next step. And um, I, I can imagine a lot of podcasters or social media brands wouldn't spend six months, eight hours a day listening to someone before they actually took the first step. Are you ready to unlock your full potential? I want to introduce you to the Fit, Healthy, and Happy podcast, a powerful resource to transform your life today. With expert interviews, practical tips, and inspiring stories, this podcast is your roadmap to lasting wellness. Here's what a listener has to say. I used to struggle with my health, but this podcast changed everything. It's like having a personal trainer, nutritionist, and life coach totally for free. With over 2,000 five-star reviews we're a podcast you can trust the fit healthy and happy podcast available now wherever you get your podcasts yeah it's 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 interesting you said that i mean i find there's two levels of podcasting when i went into Mm -hmm. the journey of podcasting 
I found you had your set podcasters where oh, I should say three. There's <laughs> ones that are very inter more educational based. And then you have your ones where they're very set, where they, the, the, the host will ask the same set questions or have set questions. And then you'll have the conversational ones, which are very, they're probably, at, now they're becoming more relevant, but at one point they're very small. And those are the ones like Joe Rogan that attract me, that conversation, that raw, just interaction where it's two people sitting at a dinner dinner table, having a conversation mm-hmm. and people are just listening to it. Yep. And, and that attracted me to the whole podcast and be able to have a con- open conversation with somebody like you and just mm-hmm. learning about you talking, um, figuring out your space, figuring out what you do for a living and, and understanding the whys and, and how you completed what your mission was. So having that all and being able to do that was something that attracted me. So I love the whole conversation, which because Joe yep. Rogan is, is literally amazing at it. He's amazing yep. at his conversation. So I love that you you did that. And it's and, and yeah, I'm I'm the opposite, man. I'm I just I put something in my head as go. I don't I don't, I, I learn as I go. I'll take my kicks along the way, but I'll just keep running and hopefully I'll make it through. So uh, I love that you took those six months. So six months in most, most yeah, most most of everything else. I'm always I'm always very aggressive, very quickly in this one. I think for some reason I was just like, hey, this is a little bit more of actually putting yourself out there. Um, so that's why I listened back. But any other ideas, like most entrepreneurs, it's like, great. I was, you know, um, a good few years ago, um, my late twenties, early thirties, literally every six months, I said to the wife, oh, I got a new idea. I got a new idea. Let's start this company. Let's start this company. Now, you know, I started multiple companies, some were success, some were failures. And, you know, I went and did an online myself and two business partners. Uh, we started an online appliance company, which at, in modern times, house, houseware appliance doesn't, doesn't seem like anything weird. We started this four years ago, five years ago in New Zealand where there's only 5 million population and everyone's like, hold on, you want me to buy a fridge and I can't see it? Like, you want me to buy an appliance, but I can't actually see it? And we, we, we went for six or six or 12 months, you know, we did well and we were like, hold on, we've got to, you know, spend money to, to grow it. And we just said, we're not there. And literally 12 months later, all the retail stores across New Zealand just went online and in the markets now, it's done. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, that's how business goes, Lawrence, right? I mean, you have your wins, your losses, every successful entrepreneur has a shitload of losses. Mm -hmm. They they, they hide away. They try not to talk about, and then you try to stack those wins higher. Right. And and you're hoping at the end of the day, you have more wins and losses. Let's talk about your, your, your journey with your struggles. Cause there's, (laughs) there's obviously medical and stuff like that issues that we, we pass through your journey. Let's, let's, let's get into that. How, when that all come about and give me a little bit part of that story. So, so a big thing to understand is obviously, like I spoke about, you know, I had this drive uh, from a young age and always wanted to be successful, grew through my twenties. And a lot of what I did was I, I achieved the success. So all the goals I'd set out to be at 25, I had all my goals I saw, set out to be at 30, I had, and in this moment came up, people said, Hey, you should do podcasting and listening to Joe Rogan as we spoke. So I started up this, this Wolf of Queen Street brand, um, like I said, um, into 2018, into 2019, And originally, I was like, I want to be like Jordan Belfort. I want to be the success and the money and the the sex and all of that that comes with the glamour. So the original branding of it was me in a white suit standing in Vegas. And I I was just like, yes, this is what's going to happen. So I started the brand under that whole, uh, you know, I want to seek Mount Everest of success just for myself and, and, and my family. And going through that moment, the brand and getting people on the show and, you know, being all being a great experience, life life sort of turned a sort of uh, an interesting um, curveball on me going into the beginning part of 2019 I had a very successful 2018 we traveled the world was really good and in the beginning part of 2019 I started feeling a bit flat so I said to my wife oh maybe you know we did too much in 2018 and uh, you know maybe the body's recovering I'm getting my mid-30s most of my joints are you know from sport injuries the age is slowly starting to catch up to me um and after a couple of months, I still felt yeah, I'm not there. Something's wrong. I'm just not all good about it. And as males, we we very rarely will put up a hand and acknowledge that there's something wrong. And we very rarely will go to a doctor. So, you know, anyone out there, please take from my experience, you know, go and get a checkup. So I quickly went over to my, my local GP and I said, can you just check up on me? Things just don't feel um, um, correct. And the GP did a test and came back and said, hey, Lawrence, we found something in your results that, you know, we're not sure about. We've, the, the first thing is we found the hormones in your body that don't exist in males. 
We also found hormones that only exist in fe uh, pregnant females and your levels over five times the level of a pregnant female. So we're like, we're not exactly sure what is going on here. So obviously I'm like, okay, in one small sense, the year's the reason why I'm a little bit off. But in the other sense, I wasn't too sure what was going on. So this was April, sort of April 2019. We're coming into the moment of finding that something's um, 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 not right here. I get set to go to a specialist, um, a specialist around that does the brain and the brain stem and everything else. And they said, normally what could cause this is a very small growth you get in the, um, around your brain stem that could trigger um, these effects. I first thought it was very weird when someone said to me, hey, there's this normal condition of something growing in your brain. But I was like, okay, I'll just take it as is. Um, so the specialist said to me, Lawrence, go into an MRI scan uh, a couple of days later, and then I'll see you in a week's time. And we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens from there from that result. So on the Tuesday or Wednesday, um, when I went, uh, my wife went with, we went and did the MRI scan. And oh, an hour later, um, after the MRI scan, the doctor calls me and he goes, Lawrence, I don't want to see you in a week's time. I want to see you at 8 a.m. tomorrow morning. And it was at that moment, I always say, uh, it, gives me, it gives me goosebumps um, every single time I say it because I can remember it vividly. It was at that moment I had a realization of and one of the many realizations of the next of the following 12 months that I know my life's never going to be the same. I, ne I know that tomorrow's never going to be the same, next week's never going to be the same, and the end of the year is never going to be the same. So we went into my specialist the next uh, 8 a.m. the next morning, walked in there, and he said, Hey, we did a scan, uh, found your brain. Wife had a bit of a laugh that he had that I have brains. And the specialist turned around and said, hey, we, we found something. Uh, we found a growth, um, and it's, large, it's as large as a golf ball. And it's encased around your pituitary gland, next to your optic nerve, and then right at the back around your carotid artery. It's literally just sitting there pushing on all these items. Um, they said, look here, we, we've got to get in. We've got to get this sorted. It's not something you can leave and just keep going uh, where it was at, at that moment. I had, I had not known due to it pushing on my optic nerve, I'd lost 30% of my sight. Uh, my peripheral vision to anyone that understands peripheral vision or literally was just enclosing. The darkness was literally enclosing around me without me knowing this. Um, when they tested me, I, I was within a week from legally not being able to drive because my sight was so bad. Um, and over the next week, going into see a brain surgeon talking about it a handful of weeks later, on the 26th of June, 2019, on my actual birthday, I went in and um, went in for brain surgery to remove this golf ball size uh, brain tumor. Um, obviously, uh, a success in some form. I'm sitting here right now. Um, but that was just the starting moment of what my life has become to date. Well, that's just the moment of my rebirth, as I call it, on my birthday. Um, my birthday since then, I don't celebrate uh, the day I was born. I celebrate the day that I was alive. And, you know, that happened there to remove this golf force size tumor, there to remove my pituitary gland, um, which controls my hormones. So anyone that's understanding about that will understand what your body will go through, the fluctuations up and down um, that I had to learn over the, over the couple of months after that. Um, but, the craziest moment, Jeff, and I'll go into uh, at the moment was I was, this was two, three months afterwards, I was recovering, trying to figure out what was my new normality. Obviously, my hormones going up and down. I'm um, still to this day, these days, I can't get out of bed. These days, um, I'm a hothead, like a 16 year old. These days, I am down and depressed, and there's just nothing I can do about it. So, after my surgery, I was trying to figure this out myself, what was going on and being very proud and successful. All of a sudden, you know, the chips just chopped off my shoulder. And then being self-employed, the money's not coming in as much, uh, you know, so three months, four months, money's not coming in because I'm recovering at home. So I call up my insurance provider and say, hey, I've been paying my insurance for 10 years. At that stage, I've had the surgery. I know I've got, a, I've, I know I've got uh, my insurance. Um, I left a good few months because I'm like, hey, I'm not going to pressurize them in the beginning. I know they're going to pay out. Got this big payout expectation to pay for me to cover my income and anything going forward. 
And then the insurance company turned around to me and said, yes, Lawrence, you've been paying us for 10 years. You've got insurance. I said, great. Let's, can, we, can we push this, the green light and I get my payment? And they turned around and said, sorry, no. Um, what you have and what you went through doesn't meet our requirements to pay your, uh, your, your payout. And I still have, and I've got it, um, uh, the email that actually officially came back from my insurance provider. And there's two, there's two lines, got it highlighted in an email and uh, it's something I look at. And there's two, the two clauses they found out um, or they got out of paying me was the following. In New Zealand, we're very advanced in our medical practice and certain things. Um, the old way of doing brain surgery was actually going through the skull, cutting the skull open and going in. I'd, I'd spoken to a lot of people through my name that they went to the same surgery and they've got all, you know, gone cut up on the side. They actually did the total recall with me. They went right up the nose and did the surgery from the neck. So the one clause um, in the insurance was you've got to go through the skull for brain surgery for it actually to pay out. Any other, any other way it doesn't count. And in the second one, which makes me laugh because I have to laugh, otherwise I just get angry, is they said, oh, you're healthy enough and you've recovered, so we're not going to pay you as well. And I, had to, I got a letter from my specialist, surgeon, and everything else to show that, hold on, I've lost my control of my hormones. I've take, I take meds for the rest of my life. If I get into a car accident or any trauma, my body was shut down instantly. Um, about nine months after my surgery, I went and had a tattoo just to the remembrance of what I went through. And my whole body shut down within three hours because my body can't produce hormones to fight any challenges. Um, and the banks, uh, my insurance company, which was through my banks, telling me, you're healthy enough, you know, you're going to make it through. So then, you know, that was, again, another hard moment. Uh, then going, I got no income coming in. Um, I haven't got the protection I thought I had, you know, because six months before I was blown all the cash we had and everything else. I had all, all the investments, but just spending it all. And it came to the beginning part of uh, February 2020, uh, which is actually not so far on, uh, long ago. I bounced on a mortgage. Um, I was ex a very, very large amount of money in the hole, um, bounced on a mortgage, and I couldn't see where I could pay uh, my bills. I couldn't see where I was going to pay my bills in 30 days' time. I want my kids, how I was going to afford my kids' school fees. And also at that moment, which is pretty much the darkest moment in my life of not being able to see financially from this big success person I was, where I was going to go next, me and my wife, because I changed so much and wouldn't really acknowledge and accept it as males do, no longer see it, were seen eye to eye. Um, we became two different people from, or I became a different person from when we got married. So we had to come out in the same month publicly to our friends and go, we don't think we're going to be married anymore. We don't think we can get through this because we no longer, our relationship is no longer based on the same, you know, things that we were and the love and everything else. So sort of the darkest, the real darkest moment of me hitting the bottom of um, financial ruin, our loss of marriage, and everything else, just sitting there um, in the dark and not knowing where to go next. How long ago was this all? That was February 2020. So this is very recent. Yeah. Are you are you uh, are you officially separated with your wife? Or are you guys still? No. So no, we we still together. We still we 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 still together. We very much in love and work through it. Um, Let's we'll talk about that in a sec. Hold that thought. Yeah. I, I want to talk about in North America. Um, I'll talk about Canada. Mm. I've heard so many horror stories on insurances like that. Mm. And um, we had, I had really probably one of my only real childhood friends um, in his early thirties, 33 passed away with a brain tumor. Mm. Uh, he was obviously not as fortunate and um, it, it was, it, it happened so quickly. It was, um, he was at work. It was a Thursday. He passed out at work. They, they rushed him to the ER. They found the tumor. Um, and by the following Tuesday, they found it was stage four. And it was the size, mm -hmm. it was, it was the size of, of, of a pretty much a, a softball or almost yeah. a, like a, a baseball at that point. And uh, he, 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 he was around for another five, six months. Mm -hmm. So it was a very, um, it was a very, and, but he fought with his insurance and insurance yeah. was trying to refuse to pay for the chemo. 
And we went through all this and I saw all this and it's just a lot of people just sign and start doing their insurance and pay and think they're going to be covered and all, everything's great. And then Mm -hmm. when shit hits the fan, they don't realize. So it's very important for people to read the dotted line, to ask the questions. Yep. And that goes with anything in life is ask the questions and make sure they are all answered properly and in writing. So yep. if life does happen, uh, you're not stuck in a situation like Lawrence and and stuck in 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 in, in your darkest moments alone because insurance mm-hmm. should be there to help you. You, yep. you. you you put your trust in them, right? So I think that's very valid. So when did it turn around with your uh, with your wife? So so in February 2020, um, like I said, in that moment, um, I had I, I talk about it sort of. In the darkest moment I was, there was still a little glimmer I could make out. Um, and I talked to a lot of people. I'd seen that if you're willing, you will still see a small, very uh, a small light at the end of the the dark tunnel. And there was a little bit of light there. So I had my my personal challenges as well as my career and financial challenges. And I and I seeked out or actually begged um, a couple of um, companies that I'm still part of today to take me out on the business side and figure out how I can take the next steps around my mortgages and investments and everything else. But on my, but on my, on the wife side of things, once we finally came out, it was that first acknowledgement of, Hey, there is an actual problem. Um, and then we could sit down and discuss and talk about it. And one of the biggest things was because I'd become a different person, uh, my reactions were different. My, uh, like I said, I've, I've always been a little bit hot headedness um, as a kid, um, agro as a teenager and this sort of came back into my life so I was losing it at my wife and at my kids and being very aggressive um, just for no reasons so once I could say okay I'm gonna, I'm gonna agree to my wife at that moment there's something wrong let's implement some rules so we can try and figure it out and one of the biggest things and one of the most simple things was is we built in a safe word and what the safe word fundamentally meant between myself and my wife was because she knew I would get triggered or I, or I felt something was just going to let me blow, if any one of us said the safe word, no matter what was going on, we had to stop and we had to walk away from the situation. So if I was going and my wife could feel that I was going to lose it for some reason because something was pushing it, she would drop the safe word and I would hear it and acknowledge and then walk away or go do something else and we had to break that reaction and both ways. And the craziest, the craziness was when this started, we're like, okay, cool. I, I said to myself, oh, okay, you know, we, we'll get to, we'll do this a couple of times a week. It might come up. And it was literally three, four, five times a day in the beginning, the safe word had to be used. It's crazy. And the, tri- I, the triggers, huh? Yeah. And, and, and the triggers, bec- and this is where the realization was of how much of a pain I really was being at that time. Cause I had a realization of holy crap. My wife today had to tell me five times to stop and walk away because I was getting out of hand. And in from being able to do that, there was a slow realization of, okay, you know, trying to pay attention and learning how, how I am as a different person and slowly going down from three to four times a day to once or twice to, you know, every couple of days and be able to turn back that whole, you know, misalignment of myself was be able to bring back to, you know, where where we are and where we originally were. Don't get me wrong. There's still days we butt heads because I still have, I have troubles controlling myself and not realizing that, but we had to spend three or four months working through it exceptionally hard to, to get to learn um, who the new me was. And I think that was one of the hardest things for my wife was the man she had married at that stage. Oh, what would, would have been um, 2007, so 12, 13 years at that stage, all of a sudden was a different, different person. So it was more working through and that going, okay, we're going to work at it. And now almost having to learn and love a new person to the person you were just six months ago or 12 months ago and working through that consistently. And like I said, we still have the challenges. Um, we just have to both be open to take criticism and in a positive way so that we can still pivot when need be. Yeah, I think every relationship, I mean, no relationship is perfect. Anybody that says their relationship is perfect is full of shit, right? Yeah. And and understanding <laughs> that everything's a work in progress. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the most important thing with keeping a relationship strong is is asking the right questions yep. and being open to listening. I think a lot of people, especially once you have children, especially if you have young children, mm-hmm. they become your priority. 
And then all of a sudden, do you forget that you started that relationship before those children came along Mm -hmm. and, and you don't put enough love or attention to that relationship. And what happens is you start focusing on the kids, dance, sports, and it's just go, 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 go. Mm -hmm. Life's busy businesses. And you forget about that and you become numb. And, and over time that numbness just continues and continues and and you, and you slowly start falling apart without even realizing it. Yep. And it's very important. I mean, one thing me and my wife do is, uh, God, at least five times a week, uh, usually Monday to Friday, our kids are, we're a little lucky. Our kids are a little older and they're very independent. Mm. But uh, when the kids are going down, we'll literally go for a power walk together every single yep. night. And it's about a 30 minute walk, but it's our time to communicate and talk and ask how the day was and how it came in and just reconnect just on a mental aspect which i think is so important to ask questions and ask how she was or how she'll ask me how mm-hmm. i was or how the day was or any do you have any issues and, and being able to have that open communication so valuable even if it's for half an hour a day or 20 yep. minutes a day but i just think it's something that a lot of people don't do they just become very numb and and that numbness ends up just slowly drifting apart and re- before you realize it you feel like there's no coming back and a mm-hmm. lot of people won't even give the effort to come back because nowadays it feels like you, you you always hear those like your your parents your grandparents i mean they would through thick and thin stick thin, together yeah. nowadays you you breathe the wrong way and people are like divorce divorce yeah. divorce in canada i think it's uh four or three or f- four out of every six or three out of every five marriages within the first five years end up in divorce it's crazy it's crazy crazy yeah. crazy, and crazy, COVID, crazy and covid covid didn't help my my parents uh, you're aware my, my dad has recently passed away and um, my parents, my mom and my dad, when she was 13, and they were together um, till my, my mom just turned 70. So you're looking at mm. 56 years, 51 years married. My dad mm. took early retirement at 55. My mom was 50 years old, and, and they both took early retirement because they financially they had enough to put a bank yep. and they just want to enjoy life. And my dad had a really good pension. And for the last almost 25 years of their life, they were never apart one day. Yeah. And they just, they're always together, always happy. And if they could have that relationship and being together 24 mm-hmm. seven, anybody could do it. It's just being able to communicate and appreciate each other. And uh, yeah, so I love that. So how many children do you have? Two. How old are they? Uh, so my daughter turns 13. She's counting it down on the 26th of September. So it depends when the episode comes out. She turns 13. And my son turns 10 a month later. So sort of uh, get into the uh, the yeah. trouble. So you're very close to my, 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 my son's 13. My daughter just turned 15. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's it's a fun age, right? They're very independent. They they As a parent, like, I don't know how you are, but we from a very young age taught our kids how to be independent. I think mm-hmm. we talked about this before, like my kids yeah. cook, clean, do everything. So it's, 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 it's such a, it's, it's a, I love seeing that, that they have that independence, a lot the doors, put on their alarms, like they could do stuff for themselves. They fend for themselves. So I, it, it just allows you to have that. So you could take a step back and now have that freedom. My kids come here on weekends and help me work and they pack <laughs> and receive and do stuff. And, um, and, and I think it's such a, it's such a fun age to see them develop and grow and turn into young adults and all that. What does fatherhood mean to you? I, you know, I think originally fatherhood meant to to become a better person for myself. But to me now, you know, you know, when your kids two and three and four, it's hey, look, you know, me getting better self because it's still a little a little person that's not really speaking or understanding. But now, you know, my daughter that's almost thirteen and my son that's almost ten. It's about trying to make sure that I'm giving them everything so they can be the best person or best type of person they're going to grow up to be um it's just it's no more what they can offer to me no don't get me wrong my kids teach me stuff every single day and my daughter's gay got starting a gaming channel and her youtube channel is larger than mine and she's been doing it since she was eight and you know uh, is, that a little, is that a little jealousy here there yeah a little jealousy right <laughs> and um and yeah but it's more in the sense of to me fatherhood has just been able to give them the experiences um that all kids deserve and the moment and fundamentally, just let make sure that they feel loved and make sure that they feel special. We, we all live such uh, crazy and busy lives, depending where you are. And sometimes we forget that. Yeah. And there's moments, um, Jeff, how old, how old did you say your daughter was? Or, 15, no, sorry. 15. 15, right? So you, you don't get those kisses and cuddles as much as you used to. We do. Um, 
Do you? I do, you? do though. Yeah. So my, my so, so my daughter's slowly starting to tra- transition away from it, oh, but these moments. Like still- our, our kids are very like like one thing we are is very open in the way where it's like we go to bed and everybody's like, "I hey, love you, dad. I love you, dad." And yep. every morning they give it. My son's a lot more affectionate than my daughter. Mm-hmm. And that's just his nature. My son, yep. I call my son my little. Uh, when I get home, it's it's my son and my dog <laughs> having a battle to come to who could be at the first, see me at the front door of the first, right? So it's uh, my son's very uh, a very affectionate kid, mm-hmm. and it's maybe yep. because everything he's been through, yep. and and because he was so cuddled and protected as it when he was a baby, all the difficulties he went through, I, I overprotected him. Mm-hmm. But I think that has just turned him into this sweet, loving, like. He's he gets he will not go to bed without coming to give you a hug and a kiss. When he wakes yep. up, the first thing he does is have to go to your bedroom to give you a hug and a kiss. He's just a very mm-hmm. affectionate kid. And uh, like he'll, I mean, sometimes in the middle of the day, like when, during the summer break, he would call me. I'm like, what's up, T? And he's like, no, I just want to say hi, Dad, and just make sure you're okay. Like he's just a sweet kid. Yeah. My daughter is my daughter is more the very um, she's more the entrepreneur, more the independent, mm-hmm. more the hustler. But she still she still has affection. Still, I mean, we we've we've kind of pushed that from day one. So, but you mm-hmm. you'll see it. I do do not. I do agree. You do see it as she becomes a team. And she's she's, yeah. she's like she'll walk ahead of us in the mall now, and she, <laughs> she wants her space. I get it, right? Yeah. So you know, so the, those moments that my daughter. I was slowly starting to transition, but there's still those cute moments which you come over and just give me a kiss and a cuddle. And you know, any dad that still gets a kiss and cuddle from their teenage daughter will would never say no and take it. Yeah. Uh, and you know, and that, that's great. Uh, you know, to me as a father, is to say there's still there's still that bond and everything else. Um, I know in a couple of years' time, my daughter won't even go in the same mall with me because she knows that I prank and do silly stuff, so she won't want to be seen around me. <laughs> Because I'm the sort of person that will go in a sumo suit just walking down the mall just to embarrass her. Um, we're lucky that uh, we're out in the countryside and we don't go into the big malls and things like that quite often because, yeah, I, um, I've got no shame. <laughs> yeah, I dropped my daughter at school the other day and with COVID protocol, all the kids are lined up outside and they have to, when they walk in, they have to show a pass saying they either mm-hmm. they pass their test or they're vaccinated every single yep. day. So there's literally like thousands of kids <laughs> all huddled together. I'm like, really, COVID protocol huddled yeah. together, and they're all trying to get in. So I drop her off in front of the school, and 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 she goes, and she she's going to go to her friends. And I roll down the window, I go, "Bye, Sierra, I love you. Have a good day. Make sure you're home on time." And she's putting her head down, and walking so quick, like, "Oh God, Dad." But you have to have those fun moments, right? That's just this. This those are all the things she's just, she's going to remember one day when you're not around, right? All those little those little. Yeah quirky parts of you let's talk about one more thing and then i'm gonna ask you a couple of questions and to finish off today wolf of wall street um jordan belfort that was obviously inspiration of yours the branding has changed a bit but it's still very powerful uh where is the branding going now and and, and, and where's your mindset with personal branding Yes. So like I said, originally when I started, it was all about success and money and what, you know, what I can achieve for myself. And obviously going through that scare that I went through and all that realization, um, there was a massive pivot of going, hold on. I don't want anyone else ever to go through that. I don't want anyone else to ever to experience that, to to have that struggles of not being able to uh, put food on the table or pay a bill or pay a mortgage and, and everything else. So my brand pivoted quite drastically sort of um, um, from the beginning to where it is now, where it's more, uh, it's a platform now, um, uh, the branding's changed, the direction changed, and it's more platform to inspire and educate people specifically around property and business space, um, mostly around the New Zealand, Australian market and a little bit in the wider world. Um, in New Zealand, we have one of the most expensive property markets in the world. Yeah. Um, we've ju- our average house price across the country has just gone over seven seven hundred thousand US dollars for an average house in this country. Just think about that, right? The average house price across the whole country. Um, so a lot of people don't have have the opportunity to get into investments from property and stuff. So my brand now is um, getting the best in the, the market, come out and speak to people um, on the show and to provide that education. And also something that I, I'm sort of calling out in sort of my marketing tactic at the moment is I'm a place where I give away free knowledge and education with no expectation. Um I'm sick and tired. Uh, Look, I get people that have to run a business, but I'm also sick and tired that the person that hasn't got the right education because high schools don't give us the right 
future education. No. Nah has to go to a company and pay for that company to tell them what they should have learned and so forth. Yeah. So I drive a lot of my brand around that people can come over and learn, you know, the insights about investing and property and shares and so forth, not just for myself, but for my guests, uh, learning skills around business and startup companies and how to do social media and all that stuff that's in there. And at the end of the day, there's never going to be me standing there and going, hey, by the way, um, make sure you you pay me for mentorship or make sure you you you, you, pay, you buy this through that company. There's none of that expectation. So it's purely driven to improve others and inspire others compared to originally I started to make myself money and be famous. Yeah, and I think that's a huge aspect of it. And I think our our our, our visions are very aligned in that in that mm-hmm. path because I, I've always had that mindset where you give not expecting back. Yep. And over time that all comes back in 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 abundance to you. Right. Mm-hmm. So it's just that mindset of just just you don't expect, just give and give out of your heart and 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 mm-hmm. give out of your knowledge and your will. And over time, that will all come back. It might take longer, it might come right yep. away, but it will come. And 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 uh, yeah, I love that. I love that aspect of what you're doing. Yeah, if something the Sorry, go sorry, sorry, Jeff. Just to say, one of the things that people, you know, I know people that's going to be listening or watching at the moment is going to go, hold on, but how how can you do this and spend all the time and have none of that expectation? It's just, I obviously, you know, as healthy as I came, I'm back into my day job, but I do my, my IT contractor out there. Something I love that I do as well that sorts me out and uh, and my other investments I got from a financial p- p- point of view. So everything I do this around my brand, as much as there's there's key parts around it, I, it's not driven um, to seek a revenue or business behind it. So that's where I can do that and speak out um, almost for nothing because the stuff that I have on the side sort of puts food on my table now. And um, I think that's one of the big things I think with yourself as well, Jeff, like I said, we're so closely aligned was, you know, your brand started not because you wanted to, you know, do the six figure thing. Go, hey, I started a podcast and I'm making six figures from podcasts. You know, for me, that's not important. I know it's not important for yourself as well around your brand. And I thought I'll just let people know, you know, the reasons why. Yeah. And, and, I, and I think it's a lot very important if coaching or mentoring or podcasting, um, these fields are very competitive. Mm-hmm. Um, they're very, very filled with a lot of bullshit and a lot of yeah. it's 100%. Bullshit. you have to call it right yeah. everybody's everybody's a coach mm-hmm. everybody like you get guys where they're 20 years old and they're trying to coach and teach you how to do and they've had no life experience they have nothing all they've done is they spend a, a shitload of money on marketing and people think they're experts and there's yeah, tons got- of them out there there are these and and and, and i and I, I laugh at it because i mean a lot of people look at me like it 26 years later is when i'm actually giving back mm-hmm. now yeah. Right. And and I think it's very important for people to understand if that has a passion for you where there's coaching or pocket, mm-hmm. you still have to have that those passive incomes. You still have to have yep. those, Correct. you still have to have those backup plans to bring in the income to be, allow you to fully give to these other businesses or these other ventures with nothing willing to go into it with no expectation of coming back. And then once you start doing that, and then your brand starts growing because authenticity comes across. Because if you're not authentic and you're just pushing it for the financial dollars, people can see that shit. Like they can see that right across anything, right? Correct. Uh, one of the biggest things, and it's funny, I've got a whole lot of brands. Um, so obviously on my show, as Jeff would have, you talk about business. So we talk about an opportunity and you'll, and I'll talk about a, hey, go to this company. I use them, uh, you know, um, yeah. I think they're great. And people go across, right? With And I just say them because it's, it's what I think is a, an option and so forth. And I've got multiple companies um, coming to me and going, Lawrence, you've mentioned us. We've taken on so many clients through your show and stuff. We want to, you know, can we, can we give you a revenue? you from anyone you refer us and i've turned on i've turned on every single company to date um because one of the biggest things for me was just the integrity of me saying i like this company because i want to say i like this company yeah not because in the current market space that someone's standing behind me and has given me 500 dollars to mention their name about i like this company so that's why on my show when i start my show i've yes i've got a sponsored segment and i say it's a sponsored segment Everything else is I say it because I want to, not because someone else is paying me. Yeah, I love that. Um, and this and this falls part a lot of that, you know, the whole you say the, the bullshit and the coaching. I've got it, I've got a real dislike to the word coach. 
And to me, growing up as a kid and my dad coaching me majority of my sports, coach held such a high value of a word to me. I know kids that are still my age in their mid to late 30s, in their 40s, that still call or go on social media and ask me, how's coach doing? Talking about my dad. And the society has killed that word because, like, I totally agree, 20 year olds, 25 year olds going, oh, I'm a coach. Yeah. Sorry, don't get me started. <laughs> One last question. If something were to happen to you today, mm -hmm. and, you, and you did have that that moment of, mm. of, of just what is what's next i mean those yeah. probably that, that that whole night i can't even uh, even fathom to think of what your mind was all that night when you have to go to your dog next day so if something were to happen to you today in a few words how would you want to be remembered or described by your loved ones um someone that was silly funny caring and had integrity but i was always pushing the limit because I was always seeking for more. Yeah. And I think that's your natural entrepreneurial drive, right? <laughs> I think, I think one of the greatest characteristics of a, of a true entrepreneur is that drive, that hustle where you're never happy, that, that strive for perfection all the time. Yeah. So here's, here's a question, Jeff, I'll ask you a question back. Not yeah. to, uh, to, And it's a question I got asked uh, around uh, just recently. And it was, what is the one single item that you can purchase or own or that you can have for you to say you've achieved it, you've achieved life. Do you have do you have one item that you if you got it tomorrow you could walk away and go I'm done, mic drop, no more, no more, Jeff. Like a physical item that you would have to. Purchase? No, no, for, no. So it doesn't have to be a physical item. Oh. I, 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 this, this. So this came yeah, about. Yeah. I was speaking to another entrepreneur friend yeah. of me, and he said he had, he had met um, a couple, and their yeah. life goal was to own. The Christmas tree that you see in the big American malls that's about 10 stories high. And if they could own one of those, their life, they'd, they'd achieved everything they wanted to achieve in life. And he was like, Lawrence, what is that for you? And this is why I want to ask you to see, because I know your blood is a, a very similar to my blood. In yeah, what I see, I mine's a, it, so, it be, see, so, okay, let me just break this down. So it, I don't have to physically buy it. It could be just something me visually seeing. Yeah, it's something you're achieving, seeing. My, my son succeeding because yep. everything he's been through and everything mm -hmm. from the day he came home from four months old yep. till 13 years, every single day I spent three, four hours trying to better him. Mm -hmm. Whether it's mentally, spiritually, physically, a lot of it's physical. Like even yesterday, we spent three and a half hours doing yoga and stretching to help improve something. So to me, being able to sit there one day when he was he's 19 or 20, and, and we've had all these goals, like so many goals from baseball to running to him doing public speak, being able to sit there and see him at a high level and telling his story will make me feel like I've achieved everything I had. I, I was what I was meant to be. Like, I want to cry thinking about it, but that's, that's my goal. That is, that is truly to me that I could be like, he's, he's in a good space because when he was yeah. born, me and my wife looked at our child ourselves, we got him home at four months old. And he was four months old. He was still four and a half pounds. He fit in the palm of my hands at four and a half months. And, um, and through that process, those four months in the hospital, we were brought into a room four different times and the doctors wanted to stop working on it for four times. And I refused it. Yeah. And, and, and I looked at my wife and, 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 and I remember saying to her, my biggest fear is waking up, as, waking up one day at 60, 65 years old, looking at my son in a wheelchair and being like, I didn't do everything I possibly could mm -hmm. to give him the best opportunity. So that was, that was my trigger point. And then we always said, when I started that passion, I started that work with him. My mindset was always like, I wish I had a fast forward button. I think, you know, you, you never want to go ahead in life, but in my head, I wanted to be yep. 10 years later and see where he was at 10 years old. Mm -hmm. And when we got to 10 years old, he was way past my expectations. So it was such a, yeah. it was such a great feeling. So my mindset is to me, once he gets to a certain level and I could sit there and be like, he's there, that'll be, mm -hmm. that'll be my like my prize my award that is that is something my accomplishment i've made it kind of thing yeah, that's awesome love that brother what was your answer don't say it i don't have one. a christmas tree oh you didn't have one <laughs> no it is a funny one i came home and spoke to my wife and she said lawrence i know you look don't get me wrong you know my, my kids growing up and having an uh an amazing life by all means all of that but she's like, you, you, you will never have that one tick box from a success because your driver's always been too much of 
this is this is the next level and then what's behind that yeah when it comes so to, to me it'll... when i'm when it comes to business and stuff like that i'm yeah. never i'm never happy yeah never happy never 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 <laughs> never happy i'm always looking for the next bar the next thing to push the next yeah. limit and i'm always have the next idea we i just pitched i just purchased a um oh the deal hasn't gone officially through is october 13th but i just purchased a beautiful beach house mm-hmm. with his pure and and the, the place needs to be a full rental yeah. And, and, oh, and, I, and I love doing stuff myself. I'm a rental guy. So mm-hmm. um, I'm actually going to, and I'm really into, I don't know if it is in New Zealand, but in, in Canada, there's so many rental shows like fix your beach house or, mm-hmm. or Scott's yeah. vacation homes and all. So now um, we're going to get a whole crew and we're going to film the whole rentals and, and then release it on YouTube as a whole series of my rentals of this beach house. So we're oh, going to do so it. Nice. So it, it's like, I'm always trying to do trying to set the next level at something I do. Right. So yep. um, yeah, I love that aspect. This has been an awesome conversation. I, I love it, Lawrence. I am. I'm, I'm so glad we connected and obviously we have a relationship through social media, but I'm sure the relationship will go a lot further now. And um, mm-hmm. I'm looking forward to where it takes us and all that. Anything you want to leave our audience with? I, I just think anyone that's this far down the show is still listening out to us. First, I'll say thank you. And, you know, listen to the story for both both myself and Jeff, but one of the biggest things from my experience is don't plan life for five years or 10 years down the line. Jeff can tell you, you know, from his experience as well is we've got to make sure that the moment is, um, is here. The moment is now. You've also got to make sure you've got protection for tomorrow. I didn't have that. I didn't have protection when, when I ate my first hurdle, I do have that now. So think about that. Think about what is actually important and, and, and live it to the fullest. Uh, you know, enjoy the life, party the way, have the fun, um, and then put the things on the side that will allow you each day to do those fun things. And that's another discussion, another day. Um, but yeah, just just be the best you can for yourself and your family. Love it. Thank you so much, brother. Uh, thank you so much, Jeff. That's a wrap for today. I want to thank our guest, Lawrence, for taking time. His incredibly busy schedule to be a guest on the Jeff Nosing podcast. If you guys enjoy this podcast as much as I have, like all weeks, Tell your friends, tell your family, spread the word. We're trying to build something special here. Leave a review. Myself and my staff love spending time reading reviews. Until next week, guys, keep moving forward. 